Welcome to Ocean Stories, a podcast hosted by me, Lydia Carey, and me, Sarah Hersping. We may not be marine experts or even professional scuba divers, but we are curious about the ocean and ways to protect it. Every week, we chat with conservationists, researchers, business owners, and anyone else with an ocean story to tell. So whether you're a scientist or someone who's simply curious about the big blue, you're in the right spot. We can't save the seas alone, but we can do it together. Welcome to season one, episode one of the Ocean Stories podcast. We are so excited that we're finally launching the first episode. It's been forever in the making. I am Sarah. I'm your co-host. And I'm Lydia, the other co-host. And yeah, we're super excited. We are over brimming with excitement. It feels like we've had a little bit of a crash course on podcasting. And so it's exciting to finally put it out there. Absolutely. Fun fact, it is Halloween right now. And I can't unsee (laughs) that Lydia was just dressed up as a witch or something. She's not anymore. She's just wearing black black clothes. But I'm like, are we actually recording (laughs) this intro? Because I seriously just ran from being with my siblings, uh, being a black cat costume, to coming down here to my room to record this podcast so if that's not dedication to the cause then i don't know what is but anyways (laughs) back on the track absolutely love the dedication well hopefully you'll get a lot more familiar with our voices over the next month and years fingers crossed um (laughs) but we're hopeful yeah we're sarah and lydia we have been working with ocean mimic who i'm sure a lot of you have heard about for almost five years um actually to the day it's crazy and during those five years we met so many incredible incredible people and heard so many incredible stories that we thought okay why not actually grab a microphone record these um and i guess here we are here we are that was really well said yeah sarah and i met doing different things different marketing things in the ocean world And yeah, you said it yourself. We met these awesome people and we wanted to bring these conversations to a more formal setting. So it's, that's what we're here to do. Exactly. Well, we are not actually, well, we are, I would consider ourselves ocean people, but we are not marine biologists or professional divers or anything like that. So I feel like we're mostly exploring the water from the surface. Hopefully we will be, um, doing more diving very soon but yeah who are we let's talk about that we we? love the ocean but it's not like we studied the ocean we studied ocean science or anything like that however we're not starting at ground zero we're kind of this interesting middle ground of like we're in it we're out of it we're surrounded by (laughs) it (laughs) exactly Um, yeah and I think a a major point is that we realize there's a lot of podcasts out there who are great but uh because we are not actually that educated on a lot of scientific ocean terms we were like what are these people talking about I can't keep up so we are trying to break it down we're trying to make it accessible to everyone because we really want to share ocean stories with the entire world if possible and have as many people as possible join and therefore be just more curious about the ocean and hopefully also about ways to protect it because it is time we need to act we need to make a change and make sure that our oceans will be healthy and thriving in the future yeah wow that was beautiful i mean that was totally true like what we really are is people that care about sustainability and the environment at large. But we are particularly passionate about the ocean because we love being around it and swimming and surfing and all these different things. So I feel like that's what brought us here is that we actually really do care about ocean conservation and like ocean challenges. For sure. And yeah, we wanna make it chatty. We have a lot of people from different areas. We have 
entrepreneurs, we have researchers, we have people that just work on crazy projects, we have content creators, all sorts of people. They are all connected with the general topic of ocean, but yeah, it doesn't really matter what exactly your connection to the ocean is and we're so excited to bring all those stories to you and it was actually so so hard to pick someone mm. yes it first. was we had so many crazy stories but weirdly i don't know if someone can relate but what lydia and i found out during all these interviews is that we're weirdly connected to orcas emotionally this this <laughs> really was this really was an episode we were not okay after for a second um, thinking about orcas birthing their babies um, and just going through a lot to survive <laughs> and strive. While, um, yeah. Yeah, so in case you didn't realize, this episode is going to be about orcas. Right after the call ended, after we finished recording it, we really did just pause for a moment and have like an emotional little moment about how cool these sea creatures are and how they're sort of a spiritual element. So don't worry, because we're going to unpack that in the episode you're about to hear. Yes. And we will, thanks to our lovely guest, Kendra, also learn about more, lot, also learn about what's up with my words right now. Thankfully, you got it. we have a guest, <laughs> we have our lovely guest, Kendra, on, who will actually deliver all the science background here, because Lydia and I are like, so orcas are like teenage humans well not quite as we will learn but they are pretty intelligent and they're doing some crazy shit like sinking boats for funsies which that's pretty (laughs) cool honestly i mean sucks for the boat but they're just playing as we learned well that's one of the theories i don't want to i don't want to spoil too much here but yeah we we can't we're giving too many spoilers i think we need to get into it we need to get into it. Think, Let's get Kendra I, need, I think on. we need to cut the tapes. <laughs> we need to cut the tapes. Drop the mics. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to the first episode. We hope you enjoy. And there's a lot more to come after this, so we hope you stick around. Today, our guest is Kendra Nelson, a biologist passionate about marine conservation and research. Kendra became involved in the conservation world, and her career really started to focus on the endangered southern resident killer whales. In 2018, Kendra started using the power of social media to share educational posts about conservation, the ocean, and now is really focusing on the whales and marine scientists. Right now, she works for the Sea Change Marine Conservation Society and the Orca Conservancy, and she's also pursuing a degree in marine policy. So we're Super pumped to talk to her today about killer whales. Let's bring her on. Let's bring her on. Kendra, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Hello, thank you for having me. (laughs) Yeah, thanks for joining today. Tell us, where in the world are you today? So I am in British Columbia, Canada. Very cool. Oh, we were talking about that. It's funny that I asked that because as soon as I asked it, I realized... We know that you're in Canada, and we just spent about 20 minutes talking about Canada, actually. How has it been? How long have you been there? Are you from there? Give us the lowdown. So I'm from Arizona. I'm not originally from Canada. Um, I, we moved here in 2021, myself and my husband. He's Canadian. So married in, moved here. Um, mm-hmm. Love it. Wanted to end up somewhere along the Salish Sea thought it would be Washington, but got lucky and it's BC. <laughs> You're from Arizona, which as far as I know is very landlocked. What was your first connection with the ocean or how did you get interested in ocean and marine bio? Yeah, so I was originally was originally born and am from Texas. Lived there until I was about five and my family loved going to SeaWorld San Antonio. And so that was kind of the start of being obsessed with the ocean and then more specifically orcas um since i was like an infant basically like there's pictures from well i've taken pictures of the scrapbooks of when i was like a nine month old year old so on and so forth and it's just noted that like kendra loves the orcas like she never wants to leave the stadium she loves the whales and then we moved to arizona 
and SeaWorld San Diego became the SeaWorld park that we'd visit, I would say maybe at least once a year, once every two years, and sometimes more than once a year. Uh, California was very popular with my family. We had Disney passes, so we'd also go to Disneyland. Um, And yeah, I wanted to be a Shamu trainer for most of my life. I went through a stint in middle and high school where I wanted to be either a volcanologist or a fashion designer. Very different things. Very, very different things. (laughs) Um, And then I went back to marine bio but I wanted to be a Shamu trainer. That's crazy. It is incredible that apparently at such a young age, as like an actual toddler or infant, you were already so drawn to the orcas and now you ended up working with them. That's beautiful. Well, so I'm wondering, I mean, this might be a little tricky question, but what is what are your thoughts on captivity? Because you obviously were massively inspired and that's the reason you are where you are today. But um, I don't know, I'm I'm sure a lot of our followers have watched the popular documentaries and all that kind of stuff so i'd be super interested to hear your thoughts on that uh i i don't think cetaceans belong in captivity i don't think it is a good environment for them i don't think that a lot of species that are meant to thrive in open ocean deep water uh built not built but like familial bond pod like societies for them uh don't thrive in captivity However, there aren't there there are whales and dolphins in captivity now, and there really aren't solutions that are that exist and are feasible and would make sense for all the different animals that there are at different facilities across North America and just across the world. Like it's really complex and nuanced, and I've talked about it quite a bit on my page. I don't like poking the captivity bear because it is a highly contentious conversation and there for a lot of people there isn't an a gray area like a lot of people don't like a gray area it's seen as black and white you support it you don't and there's one way to do it but there are nuances i think there's a lot of gray and a lot of complexities to it that aren't just yes no because these are complex animals that require complex care now that they are in captivity and there haven't been great examples of these animals being returned to the wild, not just like released, but even in pens, because there are complications. From what I understand from what you're saying, the captivity is not the best thing ever, but the biggest issue is that we can't really let the ones go that are in captivity. But is captivity in the future going to continue? Has it been made illegal? Do you know the status of that? So. It depends where you are, uh, the status of what are the current laws, regulations for cetacean captivity specifically. In some places, it's booming and growing, like China and Russia and parts of Asia. For example, a brand new facility just opened, and their whales are wild capture from Russia. They're Russian transient killer whales. Most of the facilities in China and Russia, actually, I think all of them in China and Russia, have captured individuals. There is one or two facilities in Japan, I believe they have animals that are captive born. They've also been the first facilities to successfully breed transient killer whales in captivity because previously that was not done. So there are now three to four transient killer whale calves in captivity as well. And one has like 11 whales. Like there's, it's still growing in that area. If you want to know more about it, I would, if any, any listeners want to know more about that, know more about the individual whales and these parks, I would look at Inherently Wild on Instagram, for example. And there are a couple other uh, social media pages that update on those pop, those populations, those pods, <laughs> those killer whales that are in captivity in those places and all around the world, if you want updates. But It really just depends where you are. So yeah, in some places it's booming, in other places it's dying. Um, North America, I would say for the most part, it's a dying industry to have cetaceans in captivity. Um, For example, California 
those, well, most of SeaWorld actually, not just California, SeaWorld, up until this moment, these are the last killer whales they're going to have in captivity because they've had a self-imposed breeding ban since 2016. So they're not breeding their whales. The last calf that was born was born in 2016 or 2017. She sadly died shortly after birth, but that was the last killer whale born in captivity and they haven't had one since. So all their whales will, once those whales are dead, ideally there will not be killer whales in captivity in North America anymore because the only facilities that have killer whales are SeaWorld SeaWorld parks. There are other cetaceans in captivity like belugas and different dolphin species. Those may continue. I'm, there's no laws against it. But yeah, so it just, yeah, it kind of depends. Um, there's a, there are laws to banning it, but nothing has been officially passed that will say for all cetaceans in North America, this is the end. Like, yeah. no more after these. You must stop breeding dolphins and belugas and these other species to end the yeah. wow. trade. I have a really random question. How do you send a dolphin across the, con- like, the planet? Like, they obviously can't be on a plane, right? <laughs> Yes, they can. Um, this is a popular question Whoa. with the situation of Tokate before uh, she passed, but in the discussion of moving her from Miami Seaquarium out here to a sea pen was, how do you move a whale? How do you move a dolphin? Um, and I actually think I have a book that may have pictures. When someone tells me they have a horse on a plane, I'm already like, how is that possible? But at least they don't need to be in a box of water to survive. (laughs) Yeah, they don't. Have you seen um, Free Willy by chance? Yes. Okay. I think so so too, yeah. You know, in Free Willy, they put him on this like harness type of thing. Yes. So you get a, you get a crane, you get a whale, you pull them out, and they usually get put into, well, not usually, but when this is, because it doesn't really happen anymore with killer whales in North America, but they get put in um, those big, like, metal containers. They look like that. That, what are those called? I don't even know. You Like, if you have a Christmas tree and you go throw away a Christmas tree in those, like, big metal, like, I don't know, garbage shipping container type things. Mm-hmm. Like that, they have that with cold water and... I believe they also usually put some kind of cream or something on the whales to help keep moisture in their skin because the whales need to stay wet and moisturized along with the water in there. And then I believe they should, well, they should be temperature controlled airplanes most likely alongside keeping the water at a certain temperature. So that is generally how they do it. That sounds traumatic, but um, wow, crazy. Humans really come up with crazy ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I love that you called it uh, capt- poking the captivity bear. I think it's a great way to talk about that that issue because we've talked about this before on the show, but animals in captivity and even the movie Free Willy are movies with animals. I think now with CGI, movies don't really need to use animals, but past movies with animals, they play such a big role in connecting young people with animals uh, I don't. I've seen this thing on Twitter and online before that when everyone was a kid, they all wanted to be a dolphin trainer. I don't know. Did you guys experience that? Yeah, For I sure. definitely did. Um, my husband, I've talked about this. I'm like, ha- I knew a ton of people that wanted to be a dolphin trainer or orca trainer, and he was like, I knew no one. But the access to facilities were very different, like marine facilities in Arizona and where I was growing up versus Alberta. <laughs> Totally. Totally. I'm near ish to the Baltimore Aquarium and they I don't know if it still exists, but they had this crazy dolphin show and the dolphin trainers are just these young women that are so smart. They're so connected to the animals. And every person I knew at my elementary school wanted to be a dolphin trainer. And so that really does play a role in connecting people with animals. But at the same time, it's like, should the dolphins be flipping around for us like three times a day? I... I think it's a controversial topic. Yeah, it is. And it's just an issue why I say like the poking the bear thing is just because there are people that have like no tolerance for the conversation. It's, it's bad. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. We need to do something about it. But there's more to the story. We need to keep the animal's best interest in mind as well, especially with when it comes to conversations of moving them, because there are times with certain animals that are probably not candidates for even seaside sanctuaries that 
we may be putting our own desires to make ourselves feel a bit better about what we've done to these animals by putting them in these situations that are not good um, above maybe what's best for that animal's needs depend and that's situational. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, moving forward, technology is just improving every day. I'm saying that as if it's not obvious. And I just think with virtual reality, with, mm-hmm. I don't know, all the all the new tech out there. Listen, I'm not a tech girly, but all that stuff is going to create new solutions that hopefully will create new opportunities for people to connect with the animals that isn't as sketchy. Yeah, (laughs) there's and yeah, there's great stuff. I've done a VR experience where you're like in a pod of killer whales and things like that. Like it's amazing, and there are things that are better than captivity, and there are ways to connect kids to these animals that I don't think require them seeing them. There's that Steve Irwin quote where I think he says, um, "You see an animal, and it makes you more connected." Like we do need to connect people with what we're talking about because it does help them, but. There are just some animals that it doesn't work out. There are, And it's not just with cetaceans. There's other species that don't thrive in captivity. And there's arguments to be said, like, should many species we have be there? And then there are some species that are fine. And, like, I'm not anti-aquarium, like, any kind of captive facility. And that's, like, another layer of the debate is how far do people go with what is okay? What what When is it okay to keep something in captivity? When's it not? But... Yeah, there's there's solutions. There are things that I think easily get kids to understand, youth, even adults to understand why species are important and beautiful and amazing. That doesn't mean throwing them in a tank. Yeah, I know it's a complicated conversation. Yeah, I like to talk about it because I think by just having open conversations, that's how we're going to find solutions is just by being open, learning more, discussing things. But let's get down to it and let's talk more about these killer whales. What we're all Sarah's like beaming with excitement about <laughs> about the killer whales. Yeah, what was your next step? So you decided, okay, you're not gonna um be a fashion designer after all. Um and so decided sad. to study marine biology instead. Did you go to Vancouver right no, you said you moved there in twenty twenty one, I just remembered. Where did you study and what was that like? <laughs> So I went to BYU Hawaii on Oahu Island in the Hawaiian Islands uh, to study biology with a marine emphasis. So just to say to people, you don't need a marine biology degree to be in the field of marine biology. You can have a biology or a different science degree. I like SciComm. I like talking to people about how to get in the field. So I got to throw that in there. Yeah, so I went there with the full in. Full intention of being a SeaWorld trainer. I talked about it. I took like psych my first semester, which also funny. My husband is in that class and we didn't know. We didn't date for like a year and a half later. But I think he said he remembered me being like, I want to be a (laughs) sick and work a trainer. (laughs) And that's how I like I had announced and like introduced myself early on. It's like I want to work with dolphins and and marine mammals in captivity. I don't even I don't think I specifically specifically said orcas. I think I said marine mammals because. I was like, well, I'm going to work my way up from sea lions to dolphins to the orcas. I'm going to hit them all. That's my goal. Um, Realized probably, I think my second year that I didn't actually want to work in captivity. Part of it was I just changed my tune. And even in high school, I had been like, I don't like captivity, but I still wanted to work with the animals because I love the specific animals at SeaWorld San Diego. Like, I just wanted to work with them. I totally get you. It's a I was deep like, emotional I, connection. Like, yeah. And like, I still have that. I mean, some of those animals are like, it's weird to talk about an animal in a way where I'm like, I love them like my brother. Like, I have a necklace of orchids flukes and orchid is one of the whales at SeaWorld San Diego. And she is like, I love her. Um, Kasaka was another one. She passed away in 2017, but I like loved her with every like I sound so cheesy but I mean literally the animal shaped me I grew up watching and knowing these animals so it's just I wanted to work with them kind of my own opinion be damned I feel we can all relate to a situation where you have a deep emotional connection to something whether it started as a child or whatever and maybe you learn some contradicting information or information that makes you question okay well you know what's really what's the situation here 
And it sucks. You know, it's something to grapple with because you're like, yeah, I kind of want to just turn away, but then you can't. So I think it's a relatable situation that people are maybe they don't talk about enough. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. Like, like literally, I was so fine shirking my opinion to be like, I just want to work with the animals. I'll deal. And the other thought was, I'll change it from the inside. I'll see what I can do, which I have thoughts about now, which are that's a whole other podcast to talk about the idea of can you change something from the inside? Do you have to join an institution or is it best to push outside? There's a lot in that discussion, but I was like, oh, I'll be that trainer that's like really cool and I'll push for change and I'll be transparent and blah, blah. They probably all have, they think they have to sign stuff. So I probably wouldn't have been able to be as transparent as my little 19 year old imagination had thought because I didn't know what NDAs were and what non-compete disclosures were. I didn't know that stuff. Um, But I totally was like, I'm still going to do that. And then I hit, I think it was my invertebrate zoology class specifically that I, I was, and in that class, I remember at one point I was sitting like SeaWorld San Antonio had opened up a trainer position and I was debating flying to San Antonio to try out. Like I was a free diver at that point. I could pass the swim test and I don't, I didn't have that much experience, but I was like worth a shot type of thing. And didn't do that, obviously, but thought about it. And then sometime in that class, just something shifted. I was like, I don't want to work at a facility. I don't want to tap out at a minimum wage job. I would love working with the animals that I love, but I found that I really liked research and I liked marine biology for what it was. And instead of seeing it as a step to get to that one career I wanted. So it was just like this big shift that changed because I fell in love with little echinoderms and tinafores and jellyfish and I thought they were really cool and I was like research sounds really fun actually and that sounds like something I'd rather commit my time to and another part of that was I got really involved in different forms of conservation work from plastic pollution shark conservation and then killer whale conservation so it all kind of like meshed together into just this like shift in career goals well that's amazing and then once you got out of university, did you start working with the killer whales right away? Or did you stay with your teeny tiny little octopus and um, jellyfish? So I left school, I was working with a couple nonprofit organizations, uh, not like paid, it was volunteer, I volunteered a lot Mm -hmm. of my time working with these organizations. But when I moved, I was um, immigrating to a different country. So I couldn't immediately get a job that was paid. So I was doing I was unpaid, stay at home, working on my paperwork and looking at what I was going to do. In 2022, I joined the board of directors for Orca Conservancy, which is a nonprofit in Washington state focused on helping killer whales, specifically the southern resident killer whales, but technically all the killer whales that would call the Salish Sea slash North Pacific home. And then I... So I did that and I'm still on that board. I'm the board secretary. I'm really involved. I do a lot with Oregon Conservancy. Uh, Full-time though, I work now with Sea Change Marine Conservation Society as the outreach coordinator. I think Sarah and I are both a bit fascinated by just the name Killer Whale. It just brings a lot to mind. It brings to mind a crazy creature that's, I, I don't even know. I think a lot of people are scared of these whales. Are they actually dangerous to us? To humans? Statistically and realistically, no. You are totally safe from a killer whale. And yes, the name killer whale can sound scary to some people. It's become a whole thing online with some people getting upset if you call them killer whales because it's bad. PR. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten a lot of comments where it's like, why do you call them? You love them, but why do you call them killer whales? That's so rude. And I'm like, um, they kill stuff. So it's fine. (laughs) Like it's not, they don't, they don't need, they don't really have bad PR. Like this is not the problem to be talking about when it comes to killer whales or orcas. If you would like to call them orcas, both are perfectly appropriate names. You will find a lot of scientists and biologists will say killer whales, but orca also works. It's all beautiful they're all great names for the animal so i have like i have three crazy things that come to my mind and i'll just lay them out one after another when i think about orcas 
But to set the scenes, recently someone told us orcas have the intelligence of a 17-year-old human. Would you agree with that? Because that sounds kind of crazy to me. Like, what does that even mean? I've never heard it said that there's like the specific age. Okay. Um, so I've never heard someone say that. Um, maybe I would say they're definitely smarter than a 17-year-old, <laughs> if that is the case. I find it so interesting to even compare that because... It, it sounds kind of crazy to compare a human like when I think about okay what what does the 17 year old do and how would that look in the behavior of an orca that's like kind of hard to imagine but it seems like they're incredibly intelligent and I'm so fascinated by that and like one story that I'm just trying to wrap my head around is um I heard that there is a group of killer whales or orcas in Spain like in the Biscaya area that learned to sink boats do you know anything about it do you know why they do it or do you have a theory that stuck with you um and know more about this whole thing so yeah the iberian population of killer whales um they have been in the news for attacking sailboats specifically they go after the rudder and i am not like a killer whale behavioral biologist and so i don't like have my own theory i've read what other scientists think and i'm like oh that like i like their theory that makes sense to me um the most the one that stands out that i would say i would put my name with i suppose is uh there's it's been proposed that a few of the whales may have started doing this because they thought it was fun it was a fun game they liked the sailboat to play with it and then a bunch of others have picked it up and joined in and now their playing just looks a little more destructive because of their size and that they're very good at what they do hunting and being adept underwater and that it comes at the consequence of boats <laughs> basically that's crazy yeah it's it just seems crazy that they that they know how to do this and they apparently show each other or just learn from each other fairly quickly how to do it um another one that i'm really curious about is the one in south africa correct me if i'm wrong um killer whales are actually attacking great white sharks and eating their livers only and now the great white shark population even is affected by it what what's yeah, I'm there sure. are, there's two infamous killer whales that do it. There's more than just the two of them, but port and starboard are very well known because they have collapsed or partially collapsed dorsal fins. So that makes them very, they stand out compared to other wild male orcas who generally have a tall erect dorsal fin. Not all of them, but generally. So that helps them stand out. But yeah, they do hunt great white sharks and they specifically like to go for the liver. It's a really fatty, nutritious part of the body. So it's not unusual for lots of different kinds of animals to do, at least with bears, it's called high grading. And so I would, I'm just going to say these killer whales are high grading. They're picking the part of the animal that has a bunch, a big density of nutrients and fatty and just good, yummy, delicious things for them. And they go after that. So for bears with salmon, bears do it. Bears go after the brains the eggs and they like the skin so they'll they'll like you'll see bears eat a whole salmon but i've come across actually just this weekend i have a picture of it i found a chum salmon that clearly had been found by a bear and its brain its guts and a lot of its skin had been eaten and most of it was left behind because it just picks the big yummy nutrient parts i'm gonna keep wow. saying big yummy delicious yeah um keep and I, if anyone who's listening i'm doing some weird gestures <laughs> to do it but they pick these really good parts of the animal and they kind of just eat that and leave. And they do it with, and other killer whale populations do it with other species that they eat as well. They'll pick just kind of those yummy bits and they might leave, leave the rest. They don't like inhale a whole animal all the time. I mean, well, in a way, humans kind of do weird things like that too. You know, we eat weird parts of animals. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Well, all these stories, I mean, they are kind of a little bit eerie, but they're more than that, just fascinating. And I feel like they show just how incredibly, uh, incredible these animals are. But can you explain a little bit more? I'm just like so fascinated by their intelligence and people telling us, okay, they're super intelligent, more intelligent than um, a teenage person. Can you, <laughs> if that's true or not, that's another story. Um, can you explain a little bit more what that even means or what that look like looks like like what are things that they do that make them 
or that sh- show their intelligence. Um, I would definitely say the 17 year old thing just sounds, it sounds like one of those ways that humans try to center ourselves in understanding how animals work. And that's just, I don't think that applies. I don't think we have to cater to us all the time to understand how an animal works. An yeah. animal is intelligent in all the ways they need to be intelligent. And we don't understand that because we're intelligent in the ways we need. Maybe not need, but the way that we are intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> Say some people need. But there's like we, we do things, we know things. And that might look weird to a whale. Like if they were looking at us like, wow, they're as smart as a three-year-old orca. Like these guys are weird. <laughs> so I, I don't love whenever we always like compare the specific age of a human to an animal because it's hard to conceptualize. Like I used to work with birds and we'd always say like, oh, a bird has the intelligence and like they act like two-year-old children and it kind of works for communicating to people like I will say that still when people are like I want a bird I'm like you know you don't you don't want a bird you don't want you don't actually want a macaw you want to watch Rio and think birds are beautiful you don't want one in your home because imagine you have a torrential tantrum two-year-old in your room at all times at all times but their intelligence, it's like they're intelligent for how a bird needs to be intelligent. They're not as smart as a two-year-old. They're as, as smart as a macaw needs to be smart to ha- to be this the animal that they are. Behaviorally. Maybe it's a, like, a bit like a two-year-old. But killer whales are very intelligent. They have incredibly, at least a lot of the populations we study intensely, have incredibly complex social structures they have culture which is one of like these indicators that an animal is more intelligent is when they have like this very rigid and particular culture so for our southern resident killer whales and for other resident killer whales it's what they eat so culturally southern and among other things but one example is that they have a very particular diet of these very particular species of salmon specifically chinook salmon that makes up a very large percentage of their diet, like upwards of 80 to 90% at points of the year that they eat this one species of salmon. And they'll eat others, but they like this species. This is a big, meaty, fatty species of Pacific salmon. They're the largest salmon. Uh, back in back in the olden days, before we fished them like crazy, they could get up to like 130 pounds, these fish. These are That's big fish. Crazy. And they have language for southern resident killer whales they have a very specific language so to speak to their dialects each pod even past so the southern residents are split into three different pods j k and l pod all together they all speak the same language but even within each of the pods they have their own dialects so we'll hear on the hydrophones before we even see the whales and be able to be like oh that's j pod jays are coming in so the, the other month i was um, on San Juan Island camping and we had the hydrophones on it's like those are J's and people were able to say we know J's are coming or we know K's and L's are coming and other populations like transients sound very different from residents they like it's very fun to listen to the differences between them that sounds I think crazy transients are very cute I love transient calls but they sound very different the way they use their sound is very different so transients when they hunt they don't use calls because they're hunting mammals and mammals can hear them so they stay very quiet and they'll start calling once they've like killed something so the other the other week i was very blessed and got to see four matra lines of transient killer whales hunting a stellar sea lion which is one of the coolest things that you can ever see in your life um and They were so noisy. We put a hydrophone down in the water and they were talking and just calling. And it was so cool to be watching whales as they're hunting and socializing and then hearing them. But past that, you're usually not hearing transient killer whales the same way you hear residents. Residents are hunting fish. Fish can't hear them. And they use their calls to echolocate to find fish. So they are noisy. Residents are a noisy bunch. They are calling. They are chatting. They have a lot to say. And you can tell who's who, which pods are which, when you hear them on hydrophones. Wow. I can't believe the way you were just, like, describing this actually sounds that like they have a full-blown conversation. That's crazy to me. Do you, can you pick up certain, how do I phrase this? Can you pick up certain words, for example? Like, do you know, can you associate a sound with, okay, this might be help or, or, some, or something like this? Or is that impossible? Is it just like a... 
there may be some researchers that are looking into identifying specific calls with circumstances and starting to identify and like probably decode the language. Usually, like, and there are different calls that um, we know like the basics of. So there's this website if anyone wants to explore and listen to the calls of the killer whales out in the sailor sea i believe it's orca sound that has some pre-recorded ones you can listen to because there's like s1 there's like an s10 call so there's different names for the different types of calls you can hear and then they'll note like this call is more popular with this pod the purpose of the call that's a little bit different that's a lot harder to understand because we're not underwater with them like we're not seeing what they're doing we can't always identify what does that call mean unless you're like able to watch them as they're making a call because maybe there is a call that's like i found a bunch of fish and like in a certain circumstance it's saying that but we're not it's very hard to study animals underwater that are pelagic that can swim 100 miles a day and correlate calls with certain behaviors or certain things that they mean I'm sure there's people that are working on it. Definitely not me. And it's definitely not my area of expertise. So I would definitely like, look into it. <laughs> and maybe someone listening is like, I'm going to do that. And that's my thing now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which we would be really cool. Someone <laughs> to decode uh, the orca, different orca languages and dialects. I um, mean, it might be so, me. I'm fascinated right yeah. now. I feel like I'm just, <laughs> I'm sat here and I'm just ears open because this topic is so fascinating what exactly are you doing with sorry i didn't want to interrupt you what are you no, doing with the, with the whales like what is your expertise um or what are you working on right now so yeah i work in conservation so i'm not studying killer whales i'm not a killer whale like biologist i'm like a general ocean biologist i have fingers in many pies but i primarily work in outreach and then killer whale conservation with orca conservancy so i do a lot of behind the scenes so the it's it's boring if people are wondering <laughs> it's not it's it's not like i'm out on a boat all the time seeing whales mm -hmm. i am uh, throughout the year i have gone out for orca conservancy to um sea whales and so i have done that so i'm kind of a behind the scenes biologist science communicator that i apply what I know about biology and translate that into helping different nonprofits get the work done. Cool. It's hard to imagine that these giant creatures are being threatened, but as far as I know, they are being threatened. Can you walk us through what endangers the killer whales or specifically the Southern resident killer whales? Yes. There are a few populations of killer whales that are endangered around the world. I know the most about the southern residents. Um, some of the other ones are actually the population off of Spain. They have an endangered population of killer whale. Uh, there is an endangered population of transients up in Alaska called the AT1s. Uh, you can, there's actually a book about them behind me called, where'd you go? Um, Into the Great Silence, or Into Great Silence. Um, basically, they were threatened by an oil spill. That happened up in Alaska, the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So if anyone wants to learn about them, that's a great book about it. But the Southern Resident Killer Whales, um, they're so about them. I feel like I've given tidbits of information about them throughout this, but I'll just give a quick summary. So they are a genetically and culturally di uh, distinct group of killer whales found in the North Pacific Ocean. They are fish eating. So they just eat fish. Um, and so they're off the coast of BC, Washington, Oregon, California, and maybe the bottom tip of Alaska. But for the most part, they're sticking to kind of the Sailor Sea and off of the coast of Oregon, Washington, BC. They have been seen in California. So the their range specifically does go from Cal California, like the top of California, up to the bottom of Alaska. Um, but then they are all grouped into one clan called J-Clan, and then within J-Clan, there's the J, K, and L pods. And they are faced with a number of threats that have led to them being endangered. Uh, their primary threats are lack of prey, um, pollution, noise pollution, and contaminant pollution. I couldn't think of the word for a second. So... Throughout the years, a lot of things have led to them being endangered. The biggest one is the lack of prey because there's been a massive 
loss of the salmon populations out here in the North Pacific, and specifically of the Chinook salmon, which is their primary prey choice. Um, alongside that, there have been a lot of things that haven't helped. So one thing, for example, is captivity, which for me, it I think you can't talk about the endangerment of the Southern residents without specifically tying in the impact captivity had. So killer whale captivity started out on the Pacific coast, which whole thing, but eventually they got to capturing killer whales off of the off of Washington state as well as BC. And in the seventies, there was a very infamous capture called the Penn Cove capture. It's estimated that 80 Southern resident killer whales were roped in and that seven that just that day, seven juvenile killer whales were taken into captivity and then five died in the process of taking those seven into captivity. Um, by 1987, all except one of the seven that were taken had died. And within, so between the years 1965 and 1986, it is estimated that more than or around 50 Southern resident killer whales were lost due to captures for the captive industry. And that's a huge number. That's, that's shocking. It's, wow. Yes. So that. Sh- as you could imagine, will shrink the genetic diversity of any population. Um, And to just kind of give a little bit of context as to what one killer whale in terms of genetics can provide for their population. There is a killer whale out here, um, T46 Wake. That's her nickname, but her alphanumeric ID is T46. Uh, She's transient killer whale. And so transients or bigs killer whales, as people may hear them, those are the mammal eating killer whales in the North Pacific. It only applies to the ones in the North Pacific. Mammal-eating killer whales other places are not called transient, but here they're transient killer whales. But T46 Wake at one point was roped and was was about was captured, wasn't brought into captivity, but was roped into an inlet. Um, and she's known, she's part of, um, I think they call them the Bud Inlet Six. So they were, there's six of them that were roped into Bud Inlet and they were going to be taken into captivity. They didn't. So she was, she was let go and she was back in the Sailor Sea. Um, I have to, I have to pull up the statistics because I don't have them off the top of my head. But as of 2022, she has at least 26 known or suspected descendants. So that's 26 whales that are now here in the Sailor Sea because one whale was let back out, was was released. So losing 50 wow. from one population, some of those whales could have gone on to have huge fam- familial lines. Some may not have. That's always a part of it, is that there's obviously whales that are, like Wake T46, is she's got a lot of family. Mm-hmm. There are some whales that don't have that big of a family tree as her, but she has been an incredibly productive female <laughs> killer whale. <laughs> and... It's been amazing. The transient killer whale population is doing fabulous out here. There's over like 200 individuals, 300 individuals. Whereas currently, like as of today in the Southern resident population, there are 75. Oh God, that's really not that much. Historically, they believe the carrying capacity for this population was within the, like, I think 150. So about double Mm -hmm. of 75. A couple years we've dipped into 72. Currently, it's 75, but there have been years where that's been lower. And there have been years where there haven't been calves born at all as well. I'm glad you shared that story. I'm feeling an emotional roller coaster from it. (laughs) That's why I'm like, I I don't think you can talk about like the impacts of the Southern residents without at least tying in that historical factor that captivity has played a role in their shrinkage and we we have like scientific evidence that it kind of has because there was a study that came out earlier this year about the genetic diversity of the southern resident killer whales spoiler it's not great um it was about an inbreeding depression in the population um and they have found there's a, like there's just a lot of inbreeding and their genetic diversity isn't great and the paper specifically points that one of the causes that the anthrop Pro, and oh my gosh, words are like lost on me. Anthropogenic causes was the capture of the f- the loss of fifty killer whales in the population due to captivity between those couple decades. 
And so like we have this scientific basis and understanding that they technically in numbers rebounded after that happened. So in the 90s, their population got back up to like 90s in in the 90s. They got back up to the 90s, um, but then they dropped back down again and they have really low um, calf survival rate. It's 69% of pregnancies fail in the southern resident killer whale population. Uh, 33% fail in the late late stage gestation or immediately postpartum. Uh, 37 to 50% of calves die in their first year of life. Uh, and there's different causes, but like the genetic issue within the population is a big layer that they just don't have a lot of genetic diversity and even compared to other resident populations. So if people want to read the paper, I would read the paper because it summarizes everything a lot better than like this brief little interlude. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it like, there's a paper that came out in 2018. There were two males that fathered 52% of the calves that had been born since 1990. Wow. And then thinking so, that one of them has 26 babies, pretty much, um, already shrinks it down quite a bit, the genetic. Um, the genetic. Yeah, T- T46 is different population. Oh, okay, okay. Different, yeah. Oh, so yeah, the, okay. the transients, all the killer whales have alphanumeric IDs, and so they have a letter that indicates either the population well it does indicate population and then for residents specifically the pod that they're in and then they have the number so that for transients it's the number when they were observed so there's t46 that's mama and then there's t46a that's her baby and then if t46a has babies t46a2 or a1 would be her baby and then you see how that would you have these big long well, things. Well, you need to study math for to keep up with the names. <laughs> There's yeah, so that's and then residents are a bit different. There's just J two, J three, J four. There's J thirty five who got really popular in twenty eighteen. Be- that sounds so. I don't like saying it like that. Um, but she became well known in twenty eighteen because she carried her dead calf for seventeen days on her rostrum. Yeah. Um, she had a calf since then. J56, Phoenix. So- there was actually the first orca sighting in forever in San Diego a couple of days ago. And I wonder if that was one of your guys is up there and they made it all the way down here. <laughs> they were not. They were, oh. they are transients. So okay. yeah, those. So if you want to know more about the California killer whales, check out the California killer whale project because they Ooh, have well. all those whales categorized. So I think... If I'm thinking it's the same one, it may have been Frosty, who's also a very popular whale because he's like gray, white colored. Yeah, that kind of looked. That may have been him and his family. How far do orcas travel? Because I know that sharks, some sharks and some whales travel really far, but it seems like they are staying more in one place. A lot of killer whales, so they're not migrational in the same degree that a lot of other Mm -hmm. populations are. So like humpbacks will spend their summers here with us. Eating yummy food, it's really fun to see because they eat in colder climates. And then when they want to repopulate, they will go down to the tropic areas. So big, a big place that a lot of the whales up here go is Maui. Um, and that's where they breed and have their babies and get their flirt and mingle on. And then they come back here to eat and hang out and whatnot. Um, so they have these big migrations and same with a lot of shark species, some not a lot, but some shark species are migrational. Like you've seen the tags on like some great whites where it's like, where they're just going crazy places. Tuna do something similar. Tuna have different migrations and they go all over the place. Killer whales can travel like a hundred miles a day, but they usually stay within regions. Um, There is a type of migration that some killer whales do. So in the Antarctic, there's a population of killer whales that have, when they're in the cold waters of the Southern Ocean, they get a buildup of algae on their skin. And so they'll go up to like the base of Argentina or like parts of South America and potentially to um, Aotearoa or New Zealand to slough off that skin in the warm water because the, the algae buildup might be a bit annoying. So it seems like they take these little like, mini migrations to these warmer areas where they can just slough off that layer of algae and then go back down to the Southern Ocean. So that's kind of like one of the most migrational you'll get. Like residents, their their range is pretty large from like the top of California up to BC, maybe Alaska. 
but they're not like constant, like there's not certain times of year, perhaps that we're like, they're making a migration. They tend to follow the fish. And that's kind of where you may be able to understand where the whales are. So historically, Southern residents would be here in the summer when the salmon, the Chinook salmon run start for the Fraser River. So it was well observed for a long, long time that you would see Southern resident killer whales in the Salish Sea at the time of the Chinook salmon run in the Fraser River. And the Fraser River has some really good Chinook salmon. The Chinook that go really far up the Fraser, they got to be because they have a lot of distance to go. The Fraser River is like 1,400 kilometers long. And there, I've seen Chinook near the headwaters of that 1,400 kilometers. I'm sorry, people, I don't know what that translates to to miles off the top of my head. So some people have to do some math. But those are like the big fatty Chinook that are like extra big. They got extra muscle to make it up that far. And those are the Chinook that residents really want because they're bigger and if they're hunting bigger fish, they have to hunt less. Because if you get one big fish, you only have to do that once. Versus if you have a lot of s- smaller fish, you have to extend a lot more energy hunting, which is another layer of the endangerment issue. Um, but as years have gone by, those specific stocks have shrunk, as well as all the other stocks. Same with the Columbia River, the Columbia Watershed. Same with a lot of the other watersheds that um, Southern residents are sourcing their salmon from that sounds like a weird way to phrase it but (laughs) there's specific sam there are specific populations we know that they hunt specifically that come from certain rivers so the fraser is one of those but they so summer used to be this super easy time to see southern residents and now they're like not here at all in the summer it seems like you know they've they pop by a couple times they kind of like it seems like they kind of come in they maybe check it out and they leave they're like oh that's not good and they head back out Whereas historically, if you listen to people who've been here for decades, been here for forever, they're like, we'd see them daily. We'd see them weekly. They were here. and There was food here. Wow. It's crazy how recent that change was. Um, Like how how quick the earth is changing. I'm sure a bunch of our listeners are really touched by this as well. Is there anything that we can do to help protect killer whales so like would you say there's anything that every person could do to make this issue a little bit better yes i always think there's things that people can do um and in different ways so i'll say if you have organizations you like or if you're looking for ways to support with your dollar i would donate to the nonprofits that are working on researching the southern resident killer whales and working on their conservation and there's a number of organizations that do this Um, i'm with orca conservancy so i'm going to plug orca conservancy but i'll also say wild orca is an organization i love them if anyone here likes orcas you may know dr deborah giles and she is with wild orca i love her um and they do amazing work. If And maybe you guys have heard of Eba, the whale scat sniffing dog. I think there was like a Disney Plus little documentary feature about her. But yeah, she, she's with them and she stands on boats and she sniffs out whale poop so that they can collect fecal samples to test and like see what's going on with the whales. Like what's their diet composition right now? What are their stress levels at? Is someone pregnant? Because you can tell all that from poop. It's amazing. So I really like wild orca um center for whale research is like the head of southern resident killer whale information they're the ones that do the population census every year they're the ones that have like the say on if an animal like when an animal in the population is born or has gone missing they're kind of the ones that announce it and are kind of seen as like the the i don't want to say like the head of it because everyone works together but them they're kind of the head in terms of like analogy um, SR3 is another organization that does research on southern resident killer whales. They also do some research on Antarctic killer whales, and they have a um, harbor seal or I guess marine mammal in general rescue facility down in Washington. So donating is a big way. If you don't have money, I'd always or don't have money or don't have the ability to donate. Um, I would say speak up. I think speaking up is always amazing, whether it's on social media, whether it's calling a uh, Um, representative of your state, province, country uh, for the different issues that are going on that threaten the southern resident killer whales. So in the states, a big one is the Snake River dams. So there's a variety of issues that have led to the decline in salmon in the Columbia watershed. 
a big thing are dams and culverts that have been built that keep salmon from being able to return to their natal streams where they are able to reproduce and make more salmon. So if they don't have access to that, it's kind of hard to make more salmon to feed all the people and the animals that rely on them. So there are four dams specifically on the Snake River that are, there's a big push to get those breached. So calling representatives, even if you're not in Washington or Idaho, which are kind of the two states that this is the debacle between that get a lot of the attention, um, you can call your representative, you can call and email them and just say, I'm a concerned citizen. I, you should breach these dams. Here's all the reasons why. There are some great organizations that have information on that. Wild Orca is one. They have a bit about dam breaching on their website. There's an organization called Dam Sense that has a lot of great information if you need talking points or want to learn more about it as well. Uh, Orca Conservancy's page, we also have information about that that you can look at. Um, throughout the year, there will be like more urgent calls to action for different issues, but those, like that's a big one. Here in BC, there is an oil pipeline and a terminal expansion for shipping import that is being heavily pushed against because it's going to increase tanker traffic and vessel traffic in the area by like seven fold or seven times. Incredibly high amount. It makes these ocean, it makes the Sailor Sea very noisy. It increases the chance of both an oil spill and potential ship strikes. Shipping strike isn't like the biggest thing. Killer whales generally are not struck <laughs> By ships compared to some other pop species like humpbacks, but it's still it's in, it's increasing all those threats and like an oil spill, mm -mm. like that's terrifying. And in general, salmon restoration. If you're in Washington or in Oregon or Idaho or California or anywhere that there's salmon habitat, um, get involved with salmon habitat restoration. There's most likely something near you. Eat sustainable seafood. Check what kind of salmon you're eating a lot of people are like don't eat chinook or king salmon because that's there's so many people that want to eat chinook and king salmon but there are species that critically need it a little bit more than we do and we have a lot of other options for what we're eating um so there's a lot of ways that you can help the southern resident killer whales that was a good rundown a lot of options we can pick from um well i think i think it's time for our last favorite little question what is your absolute favorite ocean memory besides orcas hunting a seal? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's just like seeing killer whales hunt a cellar sea lion. I just think it's like one of the coolest things ever. But my favorite ocean memory, <sighs> there's a bunch. But if we're going to keep it with killer whales, probably the first time I saw wild killer whales, which was in 2020, it's the same day I got engaged. It was very emotional. Oh, romantic. Um, right it's we went story. out tell us a story. no one had okay yeah so we were in washington <laughs> it was during covid we went to visit um my friend lived lives in seattle she's still there um and so we were visiting and we have another friend that lives in washington and his family has a boat and so we were like hey could we go out on your boat and maybe hope to see whales because there's no way with my college money that i was affording a 150 dollars whale watch ticket um so we were just kind of like, do you have a boat? Like, maybe we could go out and, like, see if we see whales or just get out in the water. So we did. And we're getting out. There hadn't been any sightings. But our friend's dad was just like, we're going to go to Lime Kiln. We're going to go off of San Juan Island. I always see orcas there. And this is in July. So this is in the summer. I believe that year the southern residents specifically hadn't been seen for, like, 90 days in the inland Salish Sea, which was, like, a big deal that they hadn't been seen in that area for like 90 days so as we're getting closer to lime kiln um looking up ahead someone spotted a big black dorsal fin and then i started crying once i saw it i started crying because i whenever whenever i go see wildlife i always go with like my expectations on the floor because then you're always stoked when you see something even today when i go whale watching or even just like anything I'm always like I'm gonna see nothing I'm gonna be disappointed I'm gonna be so sad and then when I see anything stoked stoked out of my mind so I was doing that I was like we're not gonna see anything I'm just gonna see a bunch of birds which is like cool birds are cool seabirds are awesome and then once I see the big dorsal fin I started crying and I there's pictures of this if you want to find them they're on my Instagram like baby like it's ugly 
ugly cry. Not like a cute, like, oh my gosh, like little wiping tear. Like my mouth was like, like, like bad. Um, and it was amazing. It was K-Pod, which was, so a Southern resident population, I saw the open saddle patches, which is one way you can tell a resident killer whale from a transient killer whale because you can tell the differences between the different types and populations of orca. So I saw an open saddle patch and I was like, oh my gosh, it's residents. And I was really involved in Southern resident killer whale conservation. So I was just like, oh my gosh, crying. Um, and then we're sitting at the head of the boat. That's not what it's called. <laughs> the front of the boat. Um, I keep saying head today, but the front of the boat and I'm watching the whales and I'm crying and I'm having a great time. And then I turn around and my now husband was proposing. Well, and so then I was already crying to and then I was like, oh my gosh. And then I put the ring on and I was like, okay, the whales. And I started looking at the whales again. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, very romantic. Love that story. Thank you. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing. So I think much. that's a dream proposal situation. I love that. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Yeah, also, you did a good whale job. spotting situation. Both things. Exactly. I love that the <laughs> whales showed up for the proposal after yeah, many days. Yeah. <laughs> they got the call. They sensed it. They were like, something romantic's going to happen, and we need to be there. We better hurry up, come back. That's, that's what I believe. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm with you there. It was just luck. It was just lucky. Well, well, let's, oh. let's not the no, simultaneous. Well, yeah, well, well, Kendra, thank you very much sincerely for coming and talking to us about all of your knowledge of the killer whales and conservation. I don't know exactly why. I think it's because these creatures are so magnificent and smart and their colors. It's just there's something weirdly emotional about hearing about them. I don't I think. Hopefully I'm not alone in that. There's something very emotional in, in me that like comes out when I'm hearing about these mother whales and the strife, the straight up strife that they're going through to, to continue their population lines. Anyways, it was thrilling and wonderful to learn about that. So thank you for coming on. For any listeners that would like to connect with Kendra, we will link your Instagram, your everything that you would like us to share in the show notes. Uh, so feel free to follow along with that for more Orca content and other content. Okay, not putting you in a box. Yeah, and just thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Ocean Stories. If you'd like to follow along on Instagram, you can find us at Ocean Stories underscore podcast for updates and behind the scenes. We'll also be sharing our ocean adventures on YouTube at Ocean Stories Podcast. If you like this episode, please show your support by leaving a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Join us next Tuesday for more Ocean Stories.